All right, we are set. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. The act of breathing came to mind as I heard everybody sign in today as we gather. It's like an in-breath of spirit that has drawn us all in this moment to provide a focus for the nature and purpose of being. And the outbreath of spirit expands the truth moving through our consciousness together for blessing to the world. That's a beautiful thing. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. The breath of life is a wondrous thing. We don't consciously think of our breathing, at least much as we move about our day. But without it, we wouldn't cease, we wouldn't exist in human form. Try holding your breath for any length of time. It doesn't take long before the lungs give up and the outbreath happens, usually with great force and relief. The Guinness Book of World Records says that the longest breath holding record is a little over 24 minutes. And that required an enormous amount of discipline and effort. The natural breath cycle is designed to be effortless. Of course, human respiration is dependent upon the planetary breath cycle. Through the process of photosynthesis, as we learned in grade school, plants and other organisms take in light and convert it into energy and part of that process releases the necessary oxygen that sustains us. Without this symbiotic relationship, human beings couldn't live. It is quite a remarkable thing. Why would we intentionally disrupt this kinship to our peril and that of our planet as humans, as we seem to be doing? I think we know the, with increasing understanding, that the answer to that question lies in human choice and will. Wilt thou be made whole? Will we come back into identity as the caretakers of this earth? Or continue with the self-serving wants that have nothing to do with the natural cycles of life. Human wanting has been the bane of our existence as a species. Somewhere along the line, we thought we could improve on the natural order of life. And since then, we have chased after meaning and fulfillment through things and more things losing our connection to what is most precious, the truth of ourselves and of this planet. By disrupting cycles, we can barely recognize the true garden state. How magnificent is the reality of our being made in the image and likeness of God what creative potential is there waiting to be released as we express the fineness of who we are? What impact can a simple act 
of kindness make? There was a YouTube moment that went viral over the recent Halloween weekend. An eight-year-old boy dressed in costume with his big bag of candy in hand and cape flying walked up to a home where a large plastic pumpkin had been set out with candy for the trick-or-treaters. When he got to the pumpkin, he realized that there was no candy left. It was empty. He turned around, looking at the line of children following behind him, and with little hesitation, reached into his bag and took two fistfuls of his own candy and place them in the pumpkin so the other children would have a treat. This act of pure hearted givingness garnered millions of viewers. I am sure many watching reflected on their own childhood, how precious Halloween candy was to them and the bigness of heart this boy demonstrated to give it away. A simple selfless act but the ripple effect spread far and wide to touch the hearts of many. In Sweden, a 15-year-old girl named Greta Thunberg, distressed by the degrading changes happening to the planet, went to the steps of the Swedish parliament during her school days, holding a sign school strike for climate, to call for stronger action on global warming. Her protest was a solitary one for a while until others began to join her. Then quickly, it triggered a global movement of millions of young people. In a few months, she was addressing the 2018 United Nations Climate Change Conference and in 2019 was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. In her address to the United Nations, she said, I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to act. I can feel the cry of the earth through Greta's expression, the immediacy of it. And I hold her and all the young people in my heart who are concerned for this planet. Their voice is growing. There is a Rumi poem. Make everything in you an ear. Each atom of your being and you will hear at every moment what the source is whispering to you. The force for transformational change is here. Can we hear it now? I don't begin to think that I have all the answers to the escalating global changes reported to us by climate scientists. Loss of species, warming and acidifying of the oceans, air and water pollution, human dislocation, etc. But I do see one of the driving forces behind all these changes that is looked quietly and reluctantly askew from the corner of our vision is the rising numbers of beings, human beings on the planet. The planet's surface is finite and cannot support the ever increasing numbers of people populating it. Why as human beings do we not want to address this issue? Perhaps it centers in a very deep seated belief that we have a God-given right to have children, and sometimes many children, and no one should take that away from us. Of course, religious beliefs and economic pressures 
to have more young people to support the aging population are factors in this trend. But from the perspective of life and the whole, is it sustainable? I think not. Again, we come back to my earlier theme that human want, separated from the purposes of the whole, leads to disaster. Are we individually willing to sacrifice a want for the betterment of the whole? When one changes a habit, it initially seems like a sacrifice. Giving up that cup of coffee one craved, or economizing on the number of trips in the car to the store. But considering the health of our bodies and the health of our planet's ecology, it is hardly a sacrifice. Two handfuls of Halloween candy opened the hearts of millions. It hadn't, didn't need to be the whole bag, just two handfuls, two handfuls. You know, life actually brings abundance. That is, that is the desire of life, to bring abundance to human beings. So it's not the will of the Lord that want to deprive human beings of life and joy on this planet. It is only human beings' strange choices that we make that puts us off course. There are some very hard and personal choices to be made as we consciously wake up to what we have done and where we are going as a species. Control can come from within as we listen to the whispering of source and perceive what the right thing to do is through our hearts or to ignore the voice and suffer the consequences. Human beings cannot hold their breath forever. Eventually, we must let go of human control and human wants. The natural state requires it. And the breath of life must exhale. We find ourselves <clears throat> on earth at this critical time. We are aware that there are many strains on the planet's ecosystem, particularly with the burgeoning and somewhat out of control growth of human population and we see cracks appearing in governments and parts of civilization what are we to make of it why are we here what is our purpose perhaps a clue comes from the words that Joyce read. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. One sentence, 
beautiful words that convey a world of meaning. We can't see the breath, we can't see air, but we know it's there. We can feel it every time we breathe or watch the wind rustle leaves. Much like the guiding force of spirit that we can sense and are aware of, but can't see directly. What about God? What do we know of God? What do we understand? Well, perhaps we have some clues from looking at the world and the cosmos. I suppose we could imagine that God could have made the cosmos as one giant lump of stuff but he didn't. The creator set about an infinite number of pieces from the smallest subatomic particles to the most massive sun and cosmos. And he must be very interested in the interaction between all of these pieces. Some time ago, I think about 2,400 years ago in China, the Taoists looked at the world and beyond and saw that all of these pieces tended to line up with either male qualities or female qualities what came to be known as yin and yang. The male aspects tend to be more logically focused, assertive, directional, considered to be light and day, and the female forces are thought to be receptive, intuitive feeling, concerned with home and setting and beauty. And the view is that there's a balance between these two forces, an interplay, cycles where one becomes more dominant than the other becomes more dominant. And in fact, there's overlap so that there are female factors in what may be predominantly male and male factors in what is predominantly female. And so the cosmos is created not only of an infinite number of parts, which can interact in an infinite number of ways, but there's a certain creative tension created by the parts that embody the male aspect and parts that embody the female aspects. And they in turn can merge and create new forms that begin to interact with all the other forms. So that we have an endlessly interesting cosmic setting to be in in these days. God could be said to be the ultimate source from which everything springs. Out of what to us appears to be an undimensional realm came an invisible universe and a visible universe. There needs to be something of an intermediate setting for the outer universe to appear. 
the first stopping point out of the undimensional is incredibly intense. And we tend to think of it by the word love, a fiery energy, rather undifferentiated. But like the external universe, there is a very intricate and complex design to love. This is further stepped down to another level that we call truth and further to life. Each level intricate and exhibiting a particular design. At the place of the emergence of love, we find our being. That is who we are. The initial emergence into the realm of dimension, even though it isn't seen by us in the earthly plane. In the initial design, there was a bridge emerging from the lowest level of life, creating a kind of intermediate substance between form and unform. This was meant, this was met by substance rising up from the forms of the visible universe. We don't need to be too concerned about how the rest of the cosmos works, but on earth, all living forms and everything is living on the earth can generate a kind of substance that rises up to meet the substance coming down from the invisible realm that we call heaven. The two are meant to meet and complete each other as a bridge between this heavenly world, this heavenly realm, and the earthly realm. When it was complete, and the generation of the living forms met what came down from the inner realms, there was a very wide bridge connecting the two with a flow back and forth so that the forms on earth, particularly the human forms, which carry the consciousness of the creator, had the understanding of heaven available to them to function. Now, there's an apparent separation between heaven and earth. People are born with no remembrance of who they are, why they're here. And some argue, is there a God? Is there not a God? Is the God the shape of this religion or that religion or this philosophy or that philosophy? No one knows. But when there was this connection between heaven and earth, everyone knew. It was apparent, it didn't need to be spoken about. There weren't even words that we use speaking about God and religion because we knew what it was. It's like the story of two fish swimming in the sea and one turns to the other and says, what is this thing I hear about called ocean? Well. It's everywhere, it's in them, it's around them. Words don't need to be invented to describe it. But somewhere along the way, this connection was lost. Those dwelling on the earth didn't generate the kind of substance that was in harmony with the substance emerging from heaven. So there was a disconnect. This became worse over time until there's just a trickle connecting the 
inner realm and the outer realm. I think of it as though the original design was something like one of these massive bridges that one sees on an interstate going over an overpass. Traffic goes both ways, trucks, RVs, big rigs, cars. But now what we have is like a footbridge. <laughs> One of those little rickety things extended over a chasm where you have to hold onto the rope and it sways as you go across just barely enough to sustain life. You wouldn't want to drive a car over one of those little footbridges. Couldn't sustain it. The truth of each of us is at the highest point of love. And at that place, there is a design. And one being, who we might call the king, who carries an intensity of love that fills us with awe and engenders a response of love in us that is so great, we would do anything for that one, even incarnate into this crazy world and endure whatever it is that must be experienced. It doesn't matter because the love for this one and for who we are is so overwhelming, we would do anything. And this is at the basis of our purpose. What is incarnation? It is, if we see it from the viewpoint of who we are in being, it's a projection of who we are into the earthly realm. It isn't who we are. It's a means for us to express on earth. It's there for a while. And when it's not there, whatever dust of the earth was picked up to create this form is let loose so that it can break down to its component parts and be used in other creative cycles. But we're still present. We're still here. We always have been and we always will be. Reminds me of those avatars we use in this digital age where people create representations of themselves they can attach to an email and a text. I have one too, actually. <laughs> and it's pretty, it's pretty funny sometimes. But we know that this little animated avatar isn't us. It's a likeness of us. It may be useful, may be fun, But we are who we are, not that projection, just as in reality, we are an eternal being that can project through an incarnation into the earth for a season. Now, what can we do to set things to right, given this situation? Earthly forms, including human beings, the human being the outer part, being the inner eternal part, should act in concert with the reality of ourselves and the laws and rules that govern heaven, the ordinances of heaven, if you will. It's the natural expression of who we are as beautiful beings. A part of undimensional God. But when these outer forms forget 
their connection and start acting in ways without regard to the truth of who we are and the truth of spirit, the truth of the Lord and of God, then the substance isn't generated out of the earth to help create this bridge that should let there be communion between the inner and outer worlds. If there was this bridging connection, this substance generated out of our living, many things would come to remembrance. We would understand who we are, the context in which we're operating, the purposes for our being. But human beings are focused on the outer world. It reminds me of those experiments we did in high school biology, where you take a, an electric probe and attach it to the muscle of a frog, and the muscle contracts. Stimulus response, stimulus response. This is the way most people on Earth live. They're focused on the outer world. There's a stimulus, something they want, as was mentioned earlier. Maybe that brings them pleasure, so they want more of that thing, or they don't like it based on their judgment, and they push it away or react against it. But their focus is completely on the outer world. The substance that they generate isn't in concert with the substance of being that's emerging from heaven. The two can't meet. The way people who are focused in the outer world live could be described as reflective seeing and reflective hearing, all based on what's out there rather than what's within and the connection they have with their eternal selves. Radiant seeing and radiant hearing is when we th see through a consciousness of oneness with source. And the concern is not about what's out there, but about revealing the quality of character that we are in truth, which is generous, which is giving, which is concerned with what's needed for the whole, which is part of uh, God the Creator's plan to let there be a wondrous cosmos and a beautiful garden-like earth in which we can live and have our, our being and be one. That really is our purpose. Those of us who are conscious of this to whatever degree have a particular responsibility to be true to ourselves, to let the human part of us reveal the glory and wonder of who we are in being, to be representative of the Lord. and to provide that inspiration for everyone on earth. It's all meant to be one thing. God created the heaven and out of the heaven sprang the earth. That was true then and it's true now. God is creating the heaven. There is a meticulous design present there. And as we look around at the cosmos, we see a reflection of this marvelous, intricate design with cycles moving according to the dimension of time so that stars are born, live, grow, and move on to something else. As is true for all earthly forms, there are cycles of of growth and expansion and understanding and times when cycles come to a point of rest. We breathe in 
we breathe, we breathe out. We inhale and we exhale. So let us return to a place we re where we can reveal divine being, not according to any philosophical view or any religious view, but based on the truth of ourselves, based upon the wonder and beauty of heaven, which reveals God the creator in the realm of form. These may be big thoughts, <laughs> and I appreciate the opportunity to share them with all of you. We have some time left, and if anyone wishes to offer their perspective, now would be a time to do so. Thank you, Larry and Joyce, for our time together today. It's great to be together with everyone aware of breathing the breath of life. I would ask that we simply take 10 seconds of silence to breathe three breaths together and be aware of the spirit of love and the spirit of blessing that we bring on earth. It's good to be together and breathing the breath of life together. Thank you both. Larry, this is David here. The clarity and the intensity of the message you brought this morning and the most welcome and wonderful intensification in the vibrational pattern itself. The modulation in the emphasis and the way it moved in rich rhythms from point to point in the tone of your voice. These two factors together, the message and the man, are absolutely compelling when present. They compel us to be present in the fire. The intensification of the fire is quite evident here where I am. The age of the Lord of the fire. And we can feel in the vibration his presence. It's quite compelling in the moment. Thank you. Thank you, David. Larry, Larry and Joyce, you've given us some wonderful starting points um, to meditate on today. And I remember the realization I had many years ago that when God breathed the breath of life, through man's nostrils. It wasn't a God out there somewhere that breathed in, but it was a God within us that breathed out through our nostrils. And this was for me a revelation because I had never thought, I had always thought of God beyond myself, not within myself. And today as I sit and gaze out and at an exquisitely pink carnation, um, not actually a chrysanthemum in my garden, displaying femininity and behind it a glorious backdrop of poplar trees in full autumn color with the sunlight shining through. I'm thinking of the wonder of yin and yang, 
male and female, heaven and earth. And I'm just grateful for this opportunity to share with all in allowing the breath of life to be breathed through us to bless our worlds. Thank you. Larry, John LeBaron here. I'd like to express deep thanksgiving to you and to you, Joyce, your togetherness in this beautiful, expressive creation this morning is is evident and exemplary in beautiful ways. Personally, you both took me on a journey of deeply feeling the essences that I've experienced all my life when I paid attention to them, the divine essences of my own creation, of my own living from a child, a baby, and I have had experiential memories. I still do of being a baby, but all the way through my life, and I'm over 70 now, and those experiences, wonderful, wonderful experiences of the life I've been given, the being who I am, have been consistent all that time, even though my attention, I, I willingly admit, has been many times drawn away and confused hmm. by distractions of this world. So your expression is beautifully healing. I find such easy, profound agreement in it been, has been brought to focus in this time. I want to just spontaneously put that thanksgiving <clears throat> and acknowledgement into a sacred hymn. In holiness before Thee, Lord, we sound Thy blessing. Thank you everyone for your varied and beautiful expressions which complement our time together. If you will permit me, I would like to expand on one thought that I brought up earlier.
I mentioned this bridge between the outer realm and the inner realm. And part of that communion relates to the restoration of memory. If mankind were to remember who we are in a way that we've been speaking about today, everything else would fall away. All the falseness and phoniness, all the ideas and views of this human state would be as nothing because we would remember. We would know who we are, not just as individuals, but as a body of mankind, of humankind. Now, we can touch into this to some extent individually, but what is the barrier to really let this happen? And I see it as twofold. One is a lack of generation of the fine substance of connection. Particularly by the collective body of mankind. If there were sufficient numbers, not everyone, but sufficient numbers of men and women on earth now, who through their living generated this fine quality of substance to create this connection, many things would come to remembrance in everyone. But there's another factor too, which is blocking this from happening. And this is shame. Now, we saw a documentary recently, which showed me how this works. It was about one gentleman who was abused sexually for many years as a child. It was terrible. Finally, when he reached the age of 14, he was able to put a stop to it. But afterward, he couldn't speak about it. He couldn't talk about it. He couldn't even think about it. He walled it off in his consciousness. And that was the only way he could get on with his life. And it wasn't until many decades later that he can even begin to approach this area because there was so much shame involved, even though he understood intellectually it wasn't his fault. We can relate to this individually. I know I can. I can look back on some of the things I've thought, the ways I've behaved in former times, and I shudder at the memory. <laughs> but I'm not that person anymore. I'm willing to take responsibility for it, but I've moved on. The same thing is true for mankind. Their shame because we have failed individually and collectively to be who we really are. It's a failure to ourselves and it's a failure to the Lord. And the consequences of that failure brought about cataclysmic changes to the earth and even to our physical forms. If there is to be a restoration of divine memory, it will be because individually and collectively, we're willing to take responsibility for our failure. It's not those people back then, it's us because we are still part of the human family. We can face it, but we can also say, that isn't us now, that isn't who we are. We've moved on. We are living as more of the divine reality of who we are than we did back then. And in that way, we can move past that and let this communion between heaven and earth reappear 
so that divine memory comes back. And with divine memory can come increasingly accurate function as individuals and as a collective body of humankind. In this, we're here to play our part. It's a big job, but if we don't do it, no one will. It's great to share these things and, and be together with all of you. Uh, if there's a final word or comment, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll turn it back to Tom. Right on, Larry. Okay. Well, otherwise, thank you for letting me take up a little more of your time, and we'll turn it back to Tom. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, everyone, for your focused attention and creative participation today. We'll gather again in two weeks on Sunday, November 24th, and our presenter will be Bill Isaacs.